I'm Susan Dre, and uh, I am very happy to be to be the hostess for uh, Dr. David Hottinger, who is the, as you can see, he's a minister, and he is the head of spiritual care at Hennepin Healthcare, in other words, HCMC, some of us know it as, uh, or Big County, as some yeah. folks call it. Um, David comes with a wonderful um, background that includes both his ministerial training, but also his understanding of how people deal with grief and loss. Um, and he's been through some of the most harrowing experiences, as those of you who have heard him speak in the past here at Westminster can um, attest to. Um, and today, it seemed to us at the Third Age Steering Committee Group, it seemed like the right time for us to think about how those of us who have had loss, which in other words means everybody in this room, right, um, how we can deal with our grief during the holidays. Um, so <clears throat> I would start with a bit of an invocation. This is from Twitter, so, <clears throat> you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, Blessed are you who feel the wound of fresh loss or of the loss, no matter how fresh, that still makes your voice crack all these years later. You who are stuck in the impossibility, frozen in disbelief, how can this be? It wasn't supposed to be this way. Blessed are you, fumbling around for answers or truth to make this go down easier, who demand answers or are dissatisfied with shallow theology and trite platitudes. Blessed are we, who instead, of demand, who instead demand a blessing because we have wrestled with God and are here, broken, wounded, changed. Blessed are we, who keep parenting, who keep our marriages and friendships and jobs afloat, who stock the pantry because what choice do we have but to move forward with a life we didn't choose, with a loss we thought we couldn't live without, one small step, one small act of hope at a time. David? Set my clock here. All right. It's okay if I take my mask off for up here. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, wonderful to, to be here. Um, I was here a few months ago to speak to the Social Justice uh, Forum and, and was very honored uh, to have that experience. This will be a different talk this morning. Um, and I want to start out by saying this was, I, at first, uh, I was very excited to um, be asked. And then as I began to work on the talk, I became a little bit um, anxious, actually, um, because uh, this, is, this talk has turned into a fairly personal talk for me, an exploration of my own uh, grief and loss during this time as we begin holiday uh, preparations and, and, and the season that's, that's approaching us. Um, last month marked the one-year anniversary of my brother's death. He died by suicide, so it was a very kind of traumatic, it's a, you know, suicide by definition is a traumatic loss. Um, he had struggled many years with mental health issues, but it still came as a huge shock to our family. And he died on the one-year anniversary of my father's funeral. So, uh, and my dad's death was a much more, um, I guess expected death, he had a slow decline through Alzheimer's disease, and that has its own grief inherent to it, uh, as you know, and, and, and many years of, of grief um, as you know, we, we, we said goodbye to my father in so many different ways, and so his, his, his death was very different. But it, it, was, it was very different to stand on the other side you know, of, of the bed um, or the, you know, the, the funeral as the griever. Um, versus the, the chaplain who is there, you know, in a, in a helping capacity. 
And so as I did this talk, it was really reflecting on my own journey as well as what I do for a living in terms of comforting people in their, in their journey. So bear with me this morning as I, it, it's, it's uh, not fully formed uh, because I don't, I think it's, we're always in process. And uh, I want to share with you some of my own recent reflections uh, on grief and loss, really using this lens of trauma-informed care. And that's what I spoke about at the Social Justice Forum. And I'll, I'll explain uh, why I think that might be a good framework to look at grief and ways that we can metabolize grief and loss and the way that that um, affects us. I'll get my clicker here. I love that quote from Oscar Wilde, where there is sorrow, there is holy ground. So this journey of, of sorrow can really open us up to you know, the great mystery of, of life and death and resurrection in a, in a profound way, um, if we let it. And uh, this is um, a quote. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, two uh, authors pretty um, heavily in this talk. And one of them is Francis Weller. Um, and um, he's written a really profound book about the journey of grief. I'm going to, uh, I'll give you a picture of that book in a second. But I love this. Woven together, grief and loss are sisters. Woven together from the beginning, their kinship reminds us there is no love that does not contain loss. No loss, it is not a reminder of the love we carry for what we once held close. Alone and together, death and loss affect us all. Um, we, we grieve because we love. And, you know, that's a great paradox as well, and sometimes a painful one. We wouldn't grieve if we didn't love and, um, and if we weren't attached. And I'll be exploring some of that in, in a moment. So this is also the other author I really am going to be using a lot is Stephen Levine. He, he's uh, deceased now, um, was a kind of a meditation um, teacher for many years. Uh, he and his wife were well known around the world for their, their work with, with dying people. Um, and I love, you know, he, he gets away from some of the clinical definitions, but it, it, they contain the clinical truths. Loss is the absence of something we were once attached to, you know, and when that that's gone, we, we have feelings of loss. Grief is the rope burns left behind when that which is held is pulled beyond our grasp. Love that image, you know, it's the rope burns. And sometimes those burns go really deep and, and they're lasting. There's acute grief and there's chronic grief. So acute grief, Levine uh, compares to a thunderstorm. It's that monsoonal downpour sudden flood that submerges almost everything in its path. You know, and those of you who have gone through a, an acute a grief episode when you have a, a death of someone or a loss of something else that's dear to you, you know what I'm talking about, you know, that thunderstorm that comes. We feel everything feels overwhelming. Um, you're terrified that all that you have known is being swept away. And then there's the chronic grief. This persistent ache in the heart, the phantom pain, that irreducible absence of a loved one or ourselves, or it's a typo, the slowly receding waters and the damage revealed when the tsunami of acute grief subsides. I'll be spending a lot more time talking about the chronic grief because I think that's the grief that is the most um, uh, exposed during the holiday season. You know, uh, when, when that grief, that's that the ache that's there can really be exaggerated and uh, exasperated around this holiday season. We'll talk about some reasons why that might be. So those are the two books, uh, Francis Weller and Stephen Levine. And actually, Levine wrote this book, Unattended Sorrow. Uh, it started out as a pamphlet he wrote for the New York City Fire Department uh, after 9-11 and then expanded it into a larger uh, work. And then uh, uh, Francis Weller, who's also uh, done workshops around the world about grief and loss. Uh, this is his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. Uh, neither uh, come from Christian backgrounds, but I find there's a lot of faith and God in, in both of these books, so I would commend them to you. Grief's heavy. I love this. And I hadn't really thought about this, that grief comes from that uh, word, that Latin word, gravis, oh, 
we get the words grave, gra gravity, and gravitas. You know, it's, ugh. <laughs> you just feel it in your bones. You can feel it in your body, on your shoulders when, when, when those waves of grief come. So we're going to talk about the physicality of grief. That's really important to note as we, we talk about how it is. And I want to acknowledge uh, we're not just talking about death. Um, there are many things that we grieve, uh, and that also the holiday season can really unearth for us. There are those relationships that, that have broken down, loss of health, uh, challenges with, um, our, uh, with, with finances. Uh, right now, what we've seen is a whole society, you know, with the breakdown in community, the difficulty connecting with our friends and our family, um, during during uh, COVID-19, those dreams that are dashed, maybe new disappointments, um, and, I th and I think that's something we, we haven't acknowledged as a culture during COVID-19, how many, I mean, how many dreams got sort of dashed, like vacations that got canceled, reunions that couldn't happen, th uh, connections that did not occur, um, jobs that have been lost. So there's just a massive... I think, um, wounds that we haven't even uh, begun to attend to right now. Uh, sorrow about the, you know, the bigger things, climate change, uh, racism, injustice, political polarization. And um, you know, a lot of that did get, I think, triggered after the murder of George Floyd. And we, and we saw sort of the massive outpouring of grief and trauma. Uh, but those wounds are still there. And then as climate change, I have a daughter who has been a big activist in, in climate justice. And um, as I talk to her, it's almost overwhelming at times, you know, when you begin to sort of contemplate what's happening to the planet and the enormous destruction of, of Mother Earth. Um, I think being able to grieve that is, is the first thing we have to do before we can actually engage in the constructive action. Uh, and so much of our, our, our society, I'll talk about this, uh, we're, we're just programmed to be in shutdown mode, in denial. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a mechanism that we really have to face and overcome. And then there's cumulative and complex trauma that's occurred. And, you know, that has to do with things that have happened to people over time. You know, many of us uh, didn't have perfect childhoods, I would guess, in, in this room. Um, those things that we grieve that maybe happened to us or did not happen to us, love that we didn't receive, um, some of those uh, big traumas that people have gone through in life, um, you know, ass assaults, violence, uh, sudden deaths of loved ones. Complex trauma refers to uh, relational trauma, things that were happening, uh, neglect, abuse, and, and those have huge impacts on us over time. And I talked um, in my last talk here about the Adverse Childhood Experience Study came out in the 1990s that really showed most Americans ha have some form of complex trauma um, with, with things that happened or didn't happen for us as children. And those have long-term effects on us, um, both physically but also certainly emotionally. And those things can really come up at the holiday times as well for people. And, and I'll, I'll delve on that in a second. So look at this, I mean, look at these statistics just from this past year. So um, three and a half million, it was about 3.4 and some died in 2020. That was a 20% increase from 2019. Uh, and obviously that's largely due to COVID. Not all, um, because we've also seen just massive increases in violence and other kinds of trauma throughout our society. Um, at HCMC, we had a 22% increase in deaths uh, last year compared to the year before. We're on track to have as many this year. Um, and a lot of those deaths are not COVID related. You know, it's other things that are affecting people. So if you conservatively estimate, now this is like giving, you know, the very like white nuclear family kind of only 4.5, you know, four to five grievers per, per death. I mean, that's a conservative estimate. Many, many more people are impacted by a death. But you think that's 14 to, to 17 and a half million Americans coping with the loss of a loved one as we enter this, this season. That's a, that's a huge number of, of people, and that's a conservative um, number. And then think about all those deaths, particularly last year, where people's um, grieving rituals were interrupted. 
we weren't able to have funerals and memorial services. Even now having them by Zoom, you know, it's a blessing that we can be connected in that way, but we're missing that, you know, that real deep human physical connection that is so important when we're, when we're going through grief. Um, I, you know, I mean, if I'm grateful for one thing, it was, well, and I, my grandmother also died um, last year. I mean, she was nearly 100, um, but she died in uh, early March of uh, 2020, so right as uh, COVID-19 was hitting. And so we would have been unable to gather and have a funeral for her had she died even a week or two later. Uh, when my brother died, um, we were able at least to have, the weather was nice enough in Ohio, um, we were able to have an outdoor um, drive-through visitation. So my, my mother and me and my children stood outside in the funeral home parking lot and people drove through in their cars with masks. It was very odd and it was in the funeral home parking lot where I grew up, my dad was a funeral director. Um, to have that, and then we had an outside uh, funeral. I mean, so I was, we were grateful to, to be able to do that, but I knew lots of people who weren't able to, to grieve together, and um, that takes a huge toll, I think, on, on, on the human spirit. So here, here's the other big thing. You know, we live in a society where, you know, we don't like to talk about death. You know, it's the elephant in the room. There's a lot of grief, phobia, death denial. And uh, this comes from Weller. Um, you know, what we resist persists. So we resist our grief. We resist acknowledging the reality of death. And that shows up in lots of different ways then. You know, it shows up in this, these spurts of violence we see, the violence of all kinds, um, different mental health issues. Um, he makes the point, Weller does, that you know, again, environmental degradation, um, the, the destruction of the earth, some of that is because of we, we have stuffed all these things into kind of a, sh a shadow, where, where, and, and things that we repress come out in all kinds of, of violent ways. So he says, I love this, bringing grief and death out of the shadow is our spiritual responsibility, our sacred duty. By doing so, we may be able to feel our desire for life once again, remember who we are, where we belong and what is sacred. This is, this is spiritual work, you know, our encountering, our encountering grief. Um, I, I love this. Uh, grief is not a problem to be solved. It's not a condition to be medicated or medicalized. There are a few exceptions. I mean, there are some people who are exp going through such a profound experience of like complex grief or complicated grief that they may need you know, professional help with that. They may need to go on medication for a while to, to bridge that. So I'm not saying, no, 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 we shouldn't. Um, but that if, if we treat grief as this illness, you know, and grief now has a, uh, there's a diagnosis in, in the new uh, uh, diagnostic uh, manual for, you know, and, and there's a lot of debate about this. I mean, on the one hand, it's good. People can go and get in their insurance will cover treatment with a mental health person for grief. But if we, if we don't want to go too far, I think, and then go, okay, all grief is a mental health disorder. And, um, and that's what it seems like some people would like to treat it as. Um, Weller says, grief is a deep encounter with an essential experience of being human. What becomes problematic is when the conditions to help us work through grief are absent. You know, get over it, get on with it. How long, how long are you gonna be stuck in, in your sadness? I mean, the fact that in the United States we get uh, at the most, like I think my hospital, I think I got three days of paid leave for the death of my brother and my father before that. And then the expectation is I'm going to go off and, well, I was with my dying father the last week of his life, so I used up all my, you know, my time just watching him die. And then, um, then there was all the, the grieving to be done. And uh, I was running out of um, time to, you know, to, to grieve. So our policies in the United States are just absurd. And, and that's probably a good company. I mean, there are probably places without great benefits where, hey, Sorry, you know, you, you're, oh, your, your husband died? Well, you know, 
take your vacation time or uh, it's going to be all unpaid. So we have, we have a lot of harshness in how we, we view this. And there's a lot of pressure to be happy, productive, self-actualizing. I'm not saying being happy is a bad thing, um, but when you feel this pressure to always be positive and you know, get on and soldier on, um, that can be a real obstacle to doing the kind of, of grief processing we're talking about today and uh, can be really problematic at the holidays, and we'll, we'll get to that. Again, this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, without attachment, there can be no love. Um, it's kind of interesting because, you know, Buddhism, you know, you think it's all about giving up attachments. And here's the Dalai Lama saying, no attachment, no compassion. <laughs> so it's, 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 a, it's a balancing act that, yes, in our spiritual life, we are urged to surrender our attachments and our clingings to things which are permanent, you know, things which aren't God. We are encouraged to let go. Um, yet, by being human, we do become attached to people. That's, that's what we're wired, we're hardwired as uh, bipedal uh, mammals, you know. I mean, look at how we're reared as children. It takes us a long time to become independent. Um, so we're, we're hardwired to, to form attachments to our, our, our parents, our siblings, our family, uh, our, our loved ones, our partners. Um, and so it's, I love this, a healing becomes not the absence of pain, but the increased ability to meet it with mercy instead of loathing. No one can wholly remove our pain. All we can do is increase the spaciousness of mind and heart in which it is allowed to decompress. Letting go is letting be. So this is about cultivating mercy and compassion as, we, as, we're, uh, as we're letting go of those attachments and, and grieving them. Um, and this, this is a challenge because um, I know in my own journey this year, uh, I went a lot to my head you know, and well, I, you know, I have all this fancy theological training and I thought, well, I should be doing some of this better than I'm doing. I, sh sh I should be functioning, functioning at a higher level. Uh, it took me a long time to be able to sort of get back at work and focus. And I still have periods where it's really, really hard uh, to come in and even do like my day-to-day -day job. And I, I did a lot of beating myself up over that. Well, I'm, you know, I'm the manager of the spiritual care department, and people are relying on me, and I, uh, I be, I didn't have a lot of self compassion, and so, this really, as I, I was beginning to delve into some of this material, to really stop and go, okay, so it's not about shutting down the pain, it's about feeling it, and welcoming it with a sense of mercy and compassion for for myself and and for other people. Um, and for me, and drawing on my, my faith that, you know, God is working through all this somehow. Although it's, you know, that's a, sometimes a challenge to, to know where and to go, okay, how, how is that happening? Um, and it's taken other people to help me see some of that. This uh, comes from, uh, it's a, you can't see, it's a 12th century poem. Uh, by a, a Jewish uh, poet, Judah Halevi of Rome. Um, for those who have died, tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch, to love, to hope, to dream, and on to lose. A thing for fool this, love, but a holy thing, to love what death can touch. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word is as a gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death can touch. Um, and it's very profound because every, everyone we love is going to die. Um, obviously, we're going to die. And uh, so one reaction for some people is I'm going to push everyone away because that will be too painful because... Why I can't have that pet because that pet's going to die. I can't have that friend. That friend is going to die. This this calls us to see all those things, all those relationships as holy that we can actually love anything that death can touch. And it's it's very very profound. 
So Levine's uh, major focus in, in, in this book is uh, attending to sorrow. And he says, our unattended sorrow contains everything we've lost and all we will never have. Our confidence that we could make life happen as we wished. Our belief in unquestioned expectations is wounded. Um, whoops, sorry, a typo. We live our life as an afterthought. Trying to protect ourselves from pain limits us, and pushes away all we love, leaving us feeling isolated. But if we gently explore layer after layer of our clinging to our pain, we beckon love to accompany us on the path to healing. We're not alone in our feelings of isolation. We're part of the worldwide community of loss. I love this. If sequestered pain made a sound, the atmosphere would be humming all the time. And you, you walk around and imagine in this room, I mean, how many losses probably are here right now or people out there with us who are watching this morning, uh, all the people that we pass on the street. Um, Yet, um, we don't have a lot of space in, in our culture, in our communities sometimes, to, to encounter that, to welcome it in a compassionate way. And so Levine points out when we shut that down, um, it really leads us um, to, to some destructive things. And Weller, uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but he, he, he calls us to walk the wild edge of sorrow. Um, I love that first one, or uh, the second. We're, we're designed to encounter this life with amazement and wonder, not resignation and, and endurance. Grief work offers us a trail leading back to the vitality that's our birthright. We fully honor our many losses. Our lives become more fully able to embody the wild joy that aches to leap from our hearts into the shimmering world. Um, and he has a lot of, he writes very poetically. <laughs> Um, so it's, it takes outrageous courage to face outrageous loss. And um, I think he, Weller in particular says, uh, and, and, I, and I think that it, this is something, faith communities really have a place in our society that you know, so many people, I think, are drawn then to their faith at times of loss because there is this community of friends there are spiritual practices. I'm going to delve into those in, in just a little bit. Um, rituals that help us grieve and, and create containers for that grief to happen. Um, and that's it's something as a, as a culture we've also been running away from. I've, I've noticed this as a chaplain for, I've been a chaplain a long time, but having grown up in a funeral home, a very traditional funeral home in Ohio, where um, you know funerals were very prescribed rituals, and you know the cars would all pull over as the procession with the body going to the cemetery would go by. Um, there was a lot of respect in you know the town uh, when you know long lines of grievers. Over time, I watched that fade away um, to the point now where um, even the word funeral has become a um, sort of a curse word in some circles. You know, we've moved from funeral to celebration of life. And I'm not opposed to celebrating life, but what about also grieving the, the, the loss and the death? And I'll have people say, well, I, you know, I don't want anyone coming to you know funeral and being sad. I just want people to be happy. Like, yeah, but we're, as human beings, we're, we're meant to feel those feelings of, of loss. Uh, Jesus wept. You know, that was, of course, shortest verse in the New Testament. Every kid in Sunday school loved that one. Uh, for the Bible drills, but Jesus was sad when his friend Lazarus died. And so we are created for that, and I worry about what's happening in our culture, even in our faith communities, where we're skipping over some of that, um, where, again, even, even the fact that we, in rare cases now, is, is a body even viewed by families. And I see this a lot at the hospital. Uh, a lot of times, the last time people will see a body is is in in the hospital room, if at all. But now with our with our restrictions on visitors, um, many people never see the body of their loved one after they've died because we can we have a very limited amount of people that can come, um, like up to six people. <laughs> um, and so you think about all the other people, and um, I I think the the act of being able to view a body has profound psychological and spiritual importance. 
Um, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do for everybody, but I worry, and, and certainly the whole funeral industry that you know we're going to make the bodies all look like they're just sleeping. That's problematic too. Um, so and it was a kind of form of denying death. Um, but I, I worry that we we're, we're skipping over so many things that then complicate our grief in, in the long haul when we um, when when we just uh, skim over you know the, the feelings of sadness. Although there's also uh, this was a part of my talk, but I heard a talk a few uh, right before COVID, um, and it was by a um, woman who had lost her husband in the 35W bridge collapse. And she said, well, you know, yeah, it was great to have this community of friends that came, but sometimes the, pe the things that people said weren't so helpful. And she said, I think two things ought to be handed out at funerals and, and, and wakes and visitations, Kleenex and duct tape. <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought, oh, well, guilty as charged, because even as a chaplain, sometimes like, like did, did that come out of my mouth that I just said to that person? Because I'm not dealing with my discomfort you know, in this situation. I'm trying to be helpful, and I'm like, oh, I blew that. Fortunately, most of the time, people don't remember what you say, but um, yeah. And uh, he, again, Weller, just talks about grief as a path to soul activation, to helping us um, really get in touch with, with who we're called to be at a much deeper level. I love this, uh, that capable of living in the creative tension between grief and gratitude. Grief and gratitude. Uh, and so here are the what Weller calls the two primary sins of Western civilization. And this is where I'm going to delve in for a few minutes to kind of trauma-informed care, and then I'm going to move right into the holidays. I promise I'm getting to the holidays. Uh, but I thought it was important to set the stage here for why the holidays can be so challenging. Um, the two primary sins, amnesia, the forgetting, you know, and then anesthesia, numbing out. And I'm certainly... Um, have done both of these extremes. And I, I think as a culture, uh, we see these, th this all over the place, how you know, we're gonna go into this massive shutdown mode uh, and forgetting mode. And part of this is because of uh, how our brains and bodies are, are, um, are programmed. Um, and this kind of comes from the trauma-informed theory that I talked about a few months ago. Um, Stephen Porges, who invented a polyvagal theory, which is a theory of how our nervous systems react to conditions of threat and trauma, says, you know, any kind of loss thrusts us into a painful, chaotic environment. Permanent absence of someone we love is the epitome of acute disconnectedness that profoundly disrupts our ability to regulate our bodies and emotions. Uh, these kind of losses create an attachment emergency. You know, if you think that we're created for these attachments and you lose that attachment, you're in a state of crisis. Um, and that impact is brutally physiological. It literally takes your breath away. So remember that, going back to that acute stage of, of grief with the you know, tsunami, the flood. Um, and you can remember, you know, the, I remember, you know, the difficulty breathing, literally, like that heaviness in, in your chest, you just stay in very shallow breaths, difficulty sleeping, or waking up at three in the morning with these, these running thoughts, um, not being able to eat very much, uh, inability to focus, uh, withdrawing from, from people in any kind of social, those, those are all things, these are all physiological responses that happen um, that make a lot of sense in the context because our bodies are going into survival mode and um, there's this acute crisis. The problem is when we create these self-blaming and shaming stories about those reactions. Well, something must be wrong with me since I'm feeling this way. Those are all very normal reactions to abnormal events. And that's, that's kind of how we are created. Um, and that was kind of what I talked about. That comes from the federal government. You know, and these, these traumas, and I really think a, a death of any kind, you, even ones that are, are predicted, there's a, there's a loss that can be experienced as traumatic. Um, that it, it may not be immediately life-threatening, but it, it seems at the moment like, well, how can I go on and live? 
when this person I've been with for so long is gone. I don't know how I'm going to survive. Uh, I don't know if I can do this. Um, and and this, this is real. I talked about this in my last talk under normal circumstances. We're going down the road. We're able to observe our environment, to receive input, interpret what's going on, process information, evaluate our options, plan and act. We're in a higher brain. You know, we're, we're in that, uh, uh, we're, we're able to act with, ra with rationality. And, uh, and most of our, you know, our society is based on being in that thinking brain. You know, our work, our financial institutions, our churches, you know, that we're, yes, I can hear what is being said, I can understand it and act on it. Well, when you've got these conditions of threat, you've got the bear coming after you, you have that avalanche coming down. Um, you're not. You're not going to go and. You're not going to solve a math problem. Uh, you're not going to contemplate a long verse of scripture. Um, you're not going to uh, go. Uh, you know, do your checkbook. You are going to just um, be in survival mode, where we know these reactions of, of fighting, fleeing, and then freezing, and those are very normal responses to to an experience of threat. Um, the problem is uh, there are some people who uh, they have, especially when you have these chronic griefs and losses and lots of things piling up on you, uh, you're unable to perceive uh, threats that are real from threats that might just be perceived threats because you're in this chronic state of hyper arousal all the time. Uh, and that's where grief sort of gets complicated because if you're always in this state of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm afraid of losing somebody else. And my grief got, I think, pretty compl complex this past year. Suicide uh, was very traumatic um, and uh, realized, um, especially being in a place like HCMC where I see a lot of very sudden loss, very traumatic and often violent, um, I would get triggered, you know, by these things and go into exactly, you know, that survival brain mode. And uh, it wasn't real helpful to trying to be a chaplain and be in thinking brain because I was just deer in the headlights. So I had to ask for a lot of help from my colleagues and go, okay, maybe you need to take this, this one because I'm probably not going to be a lot of good to that family right now. But recognizing that was a normal reaction I was having. There was nothing wrong with me. That's... That's how I was programmed to act through all this. And that's that thinking brain and survival brain. And so when the, when the rider falls off the horse, the, the, the thinking brain goes offline, we get triggered. Nothing, nothing wrong, but we have to find ways to get that rider back on the horse, to get our bodies and brains regulated again. So this is part of, part of what this process is, um, is... Um, you know, because we have these initial reactions of shame, hiding, panic, shutdown, um, to, to try to find conditions of, of safety to get the rider back on the horse as we're, we're going through these losses. Um, and, and some of these are like very deep, like that first, you know, when we've experienced losses as children or we're not met with compassion and acceptance. Um, let's face it, many of our parents, grandparents, um, they learn from their parents and grandparents um, probably not some great coping strategies and survival strategies. Um, and when we went through things as kids, um, maybe we, we weren't met in, in the way that was what we know now would have been a better way to, to, to receive that grief and to work with us as, as we went through that grief. Um, and so for us to... Um, find people in our lives who are safe, to find communities like you were in this morning where you can come and actually talk about these things with someone, or not just talk, even being held in a space where you say, hey, is it okay for me just to, um, can you just be here and just be with me as, as, I, as I try to feel these things? Um, uh, as I uh, try to, to get my, you know, just myself through the day. And those are just, uh, those are very normal things as we um, try to experience grief and sadness without 
running away from it or fighting it. Now, the caveat to this is our, what we're finding out from a lot of brain research is that we have to dose our encounters with deep grief and loss. And it probably looks like 10 minutes or so is what our brains and bodies are programmed to delve really deeply into something at a time, 10 minutes. Um, and you see this with little kids. We're learning a lot from children, you know, kids who have like experienced a, a horrible situation. And I'm, 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 uh, there's a new book by Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry that gets into a lot of this. It's called What's Happened to You? And Bruce Perry's worked with a lot of traumatized kids. And he was interviewing some kids whose parents had died in uh, Waco in the, the big, uh, you know, massacre in Waco. And then the FBI came in and, you know, firebombed the, the whole compound. And um, these, he was working with this one kid, and you know the, the kids will, will be able to stop their play for like five or 10 minutes or less, and they'll talk about what happened to their mom or dad and their feelings, and then they'll go back to playing again. And kids kind of know how to then you know, work this through in their bodies. Adults get uh, less and less able to do this. As we, we get older, you know, we get more programmed to kind of go into our heads. and. The idea that you can go to like a therapy session for an hour and talk about all this is probably not very realistic. You don't, you know, you have those 10 minutes of, of spilling it all out in therapy and then you're like, okay, now let's, I can't go there anymore. And that's okay. Um, that's kind of what we're, norm we're normally um, uh, meant to do. Um, and, we, and to find someone who can provide that safe container for us to do is really important. So that trauma-informed question, which I'm encouraging us as we get into the holiday stuff, um, reframing what, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with that guy or my, you know, my loved one that they're still, that they don't seem to be very happy this season. Well, what's, what's happened? What, what, are they, what are they going through right now um, that might lead them uh, to feel this way? And that's the trauma-informed movement. I'm not going to get into this, but this is like that. This is again the Stephen Porges theory. Um, when we're, you know, when we're that thinking brain and we're programmed to the world, and our brains and bodies are well connected. And when our, the, the ventral vagal nerve is activated, I feel great. I'm connected to the, the, the greater world. And um, frankly, a lot of our, I think, holiday celebrations are premised on this that we're all going to be in a happy, engaged, connected mode with one another. But when we go down into the sympathetic uh, state uh, of, our, of our nervous system, then, um, and, and we're feeling a sense of threat, and again, remember, every loss is perceived as a threat. Uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in danger here. Uh, I need to run you know, away, or I need to fight back. I need to push people away from me. Uh, and that's a very normal reaction to these conditions of threat. And then when we people go down to the lower, um, they go into that total flight, like I can't cope, I'm collapsed, I'm shut down. And so think about this for yourselves as, as we come up to the holidays, um, where you might be like, and this is, again, these are very physiological responses. It's not just about our emotions, it's about our bodies. And where are you feeling uh, when, the, the grief when it hits you, uh, and some of the, the strategies that uh, Porges has come up with and others who work with polyvagal theory, a lot of it, it has to do with like discharging the energy of the moment as that sense of grief or loss or threat comes to us by walking, by just taking some deep breaths, even taking a drink of water and grounding ourselves. Um, saying a prayer that has some physical dimension to it, so like traditions that use you know prayer beads. I know Presbyterians aren't probably into prayer beads, but there 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 are uh, there are Protestant versions of the rosary, aren't there? So um, ha having something um, singing music and, and Poor just does a lot with with music, and I know that's one thing this place does really well is music, and so being able to really get attuned to to, our, to spirit and body. Um, in these ways that can help us uh, feel, get back into that ventral vagal state and be, be uh, socially connected, because that's the safe, social, and engaged versus mobilized, agitated, and frantic. 
numb, collapse, and shut down. And these are all very normal states. Uh, and um, the, the hope is that we can, with some help, we can climb the ladder when we start kind of going down the ladder. And I'm happy to make these slides available, by the way. So. Safety is the treatment. And again, this is just how we are wired to connect to one another. And um, I think this, this is where the, the faith community has a fundamental role to play for, for us when we, we are in th those uh, disengaged states, those states of grief and sadness, uh, that we can help in, 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 in trauma-informed terms co-regulate one another. As you know, we're two or three gathered in his name, right? Um, we are able to feel the energy of, of, of God and spirit and actually connect uh, in, our, in our bodies, in our brains, and, and with our spirits, uh, with that, hopefully, in that supportive, safe environment. So using this trauma-informed lens, I'd like to hear just for a minute, what, what do you think are some of your obstacles, or just in general, what are some obstacles to dealing with grief during the holidays? And I'll maybe walk around, I'll put my mask on for the sake of, um, or do you want, David can, yeah, David can do that. Anybody? What are some of the challenges for the holidays in general with grieving? Could be for you or just in general? Yes. Expectations. Ex expectations, yes. Everything, the shoulds, yes. Others? Over here, okay. Others? Uh, I might want to deal with stuff, but maybe other people in my family don't really feel it. I mean, my family is great at ignoring stuff. Yeah, okay, right. 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 Yes, that's right. Yes, I yes, I want to deal with stuff no one else does. Right. Perfect. That's right. Anybody else? I've got a list. I'll give my own list here. Yes, please. Well, I'm thinking about you live in your own little uh, environmental space, and then you go to a large family or a large gathering, which might be people from various spaces, or it just, but the temporary change of place, yeah, and that, and that works both directions. Yeah, you know, you kind of either can feel invaded, or you sort of feel like you've parachuted into. Yeah, <clears throat> that that's a great point, and that, you think about that, you're. Boy, that puts you in that ladder of, well, I'm going into this other environment. I might get triggered, not feel so safe and at home and welcomed, or I'm being overrun here by these people that I only see once a year um, or more, you know, and and then all the expectations that, that go go with what that ought to look like that that gathering. Yeah. Those are all perfect. Those are great examples. Um, I have my own like little list here too. Like you already said, yeah, holidays are. I should be with my loved ones. Our holidays are a time to gather. And, um, whoops, my, that's supposed to be loved, not, uh, I thought I did a spell check on this, but I guess uh, that, that, I didn't save that version. Um, holidays are a time of celebration happiness. It's the most wonderful time of the year, right? You know, um, and so, ugh, what, what if I'm not feeling very happy and celebratory when, when, uh, when these, these holidays hit? Um, well, I don't want to bring other people down because I'm feeling sad. You know, um, there. Why, why should I be a mood killer for me to? Maybe I should just stay away altogether because if I go, it's going to remind people that I'm grieving and I'm going to ruin the party. Um, it's been X number of years since this loss. Why am I still so stuck when others seem to be doing well with theirs? Is my faith defective because I'm having a hard time connecting with God during these seasons? I mean, these are. This is. You know, we're. Coming into Advent, well, shouldn't I be happy? Advent is celebratory. Although I like, what's the one Sunday in Advent? Isn't there a Sunday, some liturgical that has more of a solemn, you know, it's more of a Lenten kind of thing. I mean, Advent is that time of preparation, but still we're all gearing up toward you know, Jesus. And uh, maybe I'm not feeling so celebratory. And is there something wrong with my faith? Um, so th this comes from a couple resources that I, I would commend to you. Um, this is from conversation, theconversation.com, and it's in the context of the holidays in particular. 
And uh, this, this author says, grief does not end. It's a reflection of attachment and love, and our connection with loved ones does not end when they die. Grief is not a sickness to recover from, but rather an unfolding to experience. Grief is not equal to sadness, but it's multidimensional and often incorporates emotional, cognitive, physiological, social, and spiritual reactions. Um, I, I would say grief includes sadness, but grief is, doesn't always come out as sadness for everybody. And that's something to really acknowledge as well and to kind of normalize that what, what one person's grieving might look like is very different than others. So I look in my own family, you know, how my mom grieves is very different than how I grieve. And um, I think in some ways my mom does a better job. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't get, get rank who, who does a better job grieving, but um, she is, is much more um, in touch with her immediate emotions. And, um, you know, I got trained to be kind of the male who detached from mine. And, it, and it, I'll need things like uh, sometimes when I, some kinds of music, when I'm um, uh, watching a movie that really touches me in a way, you know, I need stuff, I need some kind of external stuff to help me get into my body and, and to, into my emotions. Uh, my mom's able to access hers in some other way that's still mysterious to me, but um, I admire her for that. So just to, to normalize the fact that everyone's grieving looks different. And I see this a lot at the hospital. As you can imagine, you know, all the cultures that come to HCMC as well. So grieving has a cultural dimension. Um, you know, I grew up in an Appalachian kind of part of Ohio where grief looked very one way. Um, come to Minnesota, you know, and I first moved, to, I was out in central Minnesota. Um, where, you know, boy, it was very like buttoned down, like people were not there wasn't a lot of emotional expressiveness at a funeral, very Scandinavian, German. Um, then at the hospital, and a lot of African-American families there where grief it, it was extremely expressive and physical. You know, people falling to the floor and um, being you know, in bed with the body, um, African uh, traditions of grief. And then there are uh, all the cultures from Asia, varying. And I've become so respectful for the different kinds of traditions. And there's no and going, there's no right or wrong. Although I think I have a lot to learn from, for me, the cultures where grief is more physical and go, okay, maybe that's something we need to recover in some of our own traditions um, and uh, rituals. This comes from the, the uh, Hospice Foundation of America. I really like this, the three C's of the holiday Choose. Choose. Okay, it's easy to drift into activities that have the potential to increase your pain, especially if you feel like, you know, me, I'm a kind of a people pleaser, want to meet other people's expectations. But you have choices about what you do, what you want to do, and who to be with. You, you know yourself the best. Um, so prayerfully consider how to mark your loss during the holidays. Uh, I like this, having, having a ritual around this. If it's lighting a candle, um, you know, doing some kind of prayer, holding a moment of silence at your gathering, placing a memento on a tree. You know, we've just come out of a season that has marked, you know, with all saints. That's wonderful, I think, how that's been recovered in, you know, a lot of Protestant churches because we lost a sense of, you know, the communion of saints and, and, and honoring them and, and having uh, those rituals. Um, to build some of that into the other holiday season, you know, the, the happier holiday seasons and, and at, your, at your family gathering. Um, communicate. So discuss with others your choices. Um, we all grieve in different ways. And this, I know this is easier said than done in some families where there maybe isn't real open communication about these sorts of things. Uh, but as best as you can, say, hey, you know, I'm going to choose to come... Um, I would like to come for the, the dinner, um, but, you know, I, I don't think I'm up to stay and, and do all the present openings and the happy stuff. Or um, could I just come for breakfast that morning and stop by? Um, or could I just come to church with you and then not do the, the gathering? Um, that's just where I am right now. Um, and, you know, compromise. Again, recognize that other people have their own ways, and there, there's no right or wrong to grieve or even to celebrate these holidays. So, yeah, it's all about the expectations again. Uh, 
checking or abandoning the expectations. Because uh, I, I think you're right, that's, that's expectations have so much to do with our reactions. Um, I think some of us are, have very high expectations of what the holidays look like or feel like. Sorry, another typo. Others are just already, we're like, that's going to be terrible. <laughs> I'm dreading, you know, that, that gathering. I, uh, Christmas Eve is going to be, you know. And so checking those and going, well, maybe try to stay in the present and to be, um, to, to, to give up the shoulds, realize what we're, we're doing the best we can under extraordinarily stressful circumstances. And that these stress and trauma reactions are quite normal given what we're experiencing. I really love this. This came from an article I saw on CNN, actually. I'm going to be closing up here in just a minute. Um, going back, if moving away from the holiday to actually you know, going deeper to the holy day, um, where you know, there is a spiritual, religious, faith focus, uh, where holidays you know, comes to mean, hey, I'm going to take time off for work, go on vacation, have a good time. And holy day doesn't always mean that. You know, Holy Day can have joy in it, but in our, in our Christian faith, joy is always right on the edge of sorrow. I mean, with the whole the Paschal mystery of Jesus, you know, life, death, death, <laughs> and resurrection, and holding those all, all together. Um, and so even the incarnation as we celebrate, you know, going through Advent and Christmas, uh, there's joy that Jesus is coming into the world, but we're anticipating, we all know the story, what happens to Jesus, and there's some foreboding in that story. There's actually a lot of, some darkness in the whole accounts of the birth. I mean, you think about them fleeing, the Holy Family fleeing, Herod's slaughter of the innocents, um, the fact that Mary and Joseph are refugees relegated to giving birth in a in a you know little barn. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that we can grab onto uh, that will it can help us connect to some of the things that we're feeling. And this just comes from uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was a great Jewish uh, theologian and activist, close. Uh, um, uh, very big influence on Martin Luther King Jr. and, and friend, um, and this comes from his book on the Sabbath. Six days a week we wrestle with the world, wringing profit from, uh, from the earth. On Sabbath we especially care for the seed of eternity placed in the soul. The world, sorry, the world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. Six days a week we seek to dominate the world. On the seventh day we try to dominate the self. So can we connect to that deeper sense of holy during, during this season? And then my last two th slides here, some do's and don'ts. This comes from grief.com. Do be gentle with yourself, protect yourself. Don't, more, don't do more than you want. Don't do anything that does not serve your soul and your loss. Do allow, allow time for feelings. I like this. Don't keep feelings bottled up. If you have 500 tears to cry, don't stop at 250. <laughs> so um, it's okay to go through a lot of Kleenex if you need to. Do allow others to help. Don't ask if you can help or should help a friend in grief. Just help. And, you know, it's finding ways, like inviting them to group events or just a coffee or sending some food or their card their way. Um, I know we, we do this to be helpful, and I do it all the time and say, well, please let me know if, there, if there's anything you need. Well, most of us, when we're in deep grief, have no idea what we really need. I mean, in that, in that moment, and people, when they just show up, and you go, okay, thanks for dropping that off. Thanks for sending that card. Thanks for that text message. Um, I didn't really knew, know I needed that hug at that moment, and someone just was there. Um, do in grief pay extra attention to children. Uh, and I think this is very true in my experience. Children are too often the forgotten grievers, you know, because we see them running around being happy, uh, but being able to acknowledge to them, you know, well, you know, Grandpa's not here this Christmas. Um, that's really sad, isn't it? You know, yeah, you know, or having involving children in that ritual to remember as 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 we do that grief. And then here are some spiritual practices. I'm closing with this. Um, things that I found really helpful, and I think others have that I know. Um, keeping a grief journal. 
And I began, began, began to do this off and on. I haven't kept that consistent with it. But it's really interesting when you're writing down in the moment and trying to kind of externalize some of the things you're, you're experiencing. And then going back a few months later and going, oh, wow, I was in a very different, I'm in a different place now than I was then. And that's given me some, um, some solace. Um, there are times I go, oh, I was doing better then than I am now, too. <laughs> so, but because you recognize, again, you know, the stages of grief don't work in these linear stages. It's like very cyclical. And you think on one day I'm feeling very accepting and peaceful and connected. And the next day I'm feeling angry and resentful and, and denying what has happened. And that's very normal as well in the journey of grief. Uh, experimenting, I talked about this earlier, with different modalities of prayer, um, especially because of this physiological impact that these losses have on us, prayer that deals with our body, the breath prayer. Um, there's the prayer, the Jesus prayer that comes from the Eastern Orthodox. Um, Lord, you know, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner, or just have mercy on me. And breathing in these words, breathing out, um, prayer that, pe uh, that while you're walking and just having a, a something you're meditating on, maybe a Bible verse, a word, um, uh, a, a poem. Uh, Tonglen actually comes from from Buddhism, but I've I've uh, read an author who's really adopted it to, to Christian faith, and it's um, it's the practice of. Um, sort of breathing in, you you imagine like a heavy state, like the, your your own or somebody else's, like a, a dark, you know, maybe a color, like dark blue, black, purple. Breathing, breathing that heavy state in, and then breathing out peace and love and light and, and maybe a, a color that resonates with you. Um, and, uh, or it's the reverse, you know, where you're breathing in, you're breathing in peace, and, you're, and, and, and then releasing that as you connect with, with God. Um, and that's also loving kindness meditation um, and the various forms of that where you are inviting loving kindness onto yourself, onto someone else, into the wider world. And I've adopted this for my Christian faith as well, and it's been really helpful. But these are things, again, that have to do with our bodies and uh, help discharge some of that energy that comes up. Uh, connecting as you are this morning you know, with, with community. And, I th and I'm really, um, really uh, honored to be here as you, as you do that with one another. Uh, singing, music, liturgy and ritual, um, very, those are body practices as we, as we worship and we, have, we, we stand and we sit. We don't kneel as much as other traditions do, but um, having those things that uh, connect us to God through our bodies can really help us metabolize some, some of the, those grief states. And then final, finally, you know, we hear a lot about mindfulness practice, and there are lots of ways to go about that. I love this story, and this comes from uh, the Stephen Levine work. Um, he talks about a, a Zen Buddhist master. He was an American. Um, he was kind of an eccentric guy, you know, out in San Francisco, of course. Um, and, but in the 1950s, I want to go visit his teacher in Japan. And the Zen master, the American Zen master, gets, you know, flies in uh, to Tokyo. He gets to the border uh, guard, and the border guard said, I, I'm sorry, but why, why are you here? And he said, well, I'm here to meet my, you know, my, my, my master, my teacher. Um, he said, I'm sorry, but uh, there are no Americans that we're admitting in right now who, who aren't part of the war effort for um, Korea. Um, you know, we're only letting um, military-based people in here. And um, the Zen master just stopped, and he said, uh, making a cup of green tea, I stopped the war. Uh, just, just using intention. And, and, and the border guard said, oh. We need more people like you right now in Japan. <laughs> um, just with a, a, a simple, using our simple day-to-day -day practices, I mean, making that cup of coffee, I stop the war that I'm having with myself, the war I'm having maybe with God in that moment, the conflict I'm having, making, uh, uh, you know, going for that, that walk, 
I make the peace right now in, in this moment. It, it might be very different in another two hours, but uh, can we use these daily practices uh, to connect with, with God and with one another? And so that's really helped me um, be more patient with myself, more mindful, develop more compassion, uh, especially during this season as, as we approach it. All right, so with that, I went, went a few minutes over. Thank you for your time. I don't know if there's time or there's questions or whatever, so yeah. Thank you. I do have a question. Please. Can you explain and, and expand a little bit on um, staying present in the moment? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, uh, again, Levine would say a work of a lifetime, <laughs> staying present in the moment. Um, and I've learned a lot more that, about this because well, I was exposed to that concept from a spiritual practice, and I believe it's a profound one, you know, even that our Christian faith um, to say, you know, we're, we're created to be here in this moment um, uh, to, uh, you know, to embody uh, God, you know, to, to, to be present for one another. But I've, I've learned from trauma-informed care there's lots of reasons why that's really hard to do. And, you know, part of it is, you know, if, if we're under this sense of threat, um, there is a lot of uh, either thinking about the past, like ruminating, uh, or uh, worrying about the future, or staying very, very distracted. And our society is extremely good at the, the distraction part, and that's part of the, that numbing out I was, you know, talking about earlier. And I'm, you know, I mean, I, I, I have a thing on my phone that um, shows me once a week what my screen time is. Anybody have that? Wait, if you have an iPhone, I go, oh, how many hours was I looking at my phone? I mean, hours? Like, was it reading profound books on my iPhone, right? I'm just scrolling Twitter or looking at Facebook or the news. So... The whole staying present in the moment, I recognize why those challenges are. Um, but I found trying, and uh, it, it's always a work in progress, is, is a way for me really to, to have, um, to be able to metabolize that, that, all those threats and um, to get back into my body. Uh, but I've found for me, I have to have some practices that, that do this. So one of the things I do, I don't have my, my prayer beads on today, but I do have a set of like a wristband. It's got some beads. When I find myself really distracted, I'll, I will just one at a time say, okay, breathing in, you know, breathing in God, <laughs> be present in the moment. I do this a lot at the hospital when things get really frantic around me and I'll put the beads in my pocket because it's a little, and um, I'll be able to just touch a bead in that moment and go, okay, now, right now, I need to stay present for this situation, for this family. And having something physical for me is really key. I can't just do this on my, on my head. My mind is all over, so. Before you ever took the podium, I was thinking, I knew you were gonna present talking points of, of uh, logic and yeah. philosophy. Yeah, right. How to deal with this, this, this phenomenon of life. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, before you ever took the podium, I thought at the end here now, I was going to ask you, did you expect it when uh, death and grieving came to your life? Yeah. Your professional, all your professional work. Yeah. Applying these principles of philosophy yeah. would make it easy for you yeah. to through it, and then you can't mention that against your brother and grandmother. Yeah, and father. Either one of them incapacitated you. Right. And uh, yeah. even, you talk about logic, Yeah. even something as upsetting as I'm thinking about the suicide of your brother. Yeah. Why do you think, well, oh, it just flashed through my mind. It's, it's what he wanted. Mm. But, you know, yeah. well, maybe he did, you know, so logic is, I mean, Logic is one. Uh, not moved by yep. all of these things. You yep. have to go through it. And of course, it's, uh, it's so miserable. Of course, you want to get through it. Yeah. That's yeah. A, no. That's not an unreasonable way to think, but I'd like to get through this. No. And then, of course, the middle of your presentation, 
presentation. You talked about the celebration of life thing. I've noticed that. Yeah. It certainly uh, is um, uh, a great thing to remember. Get up to speak of remembrances and yeah. amusing things. And, uh, yeah. And go to the church when you yeah, get up to invite. That's uh, not quite for the funeral needs to be. And then the best part of yeah. funerals, of course, I've always thought, a lot of thought. Mm. Is the reception afterwards. Yes, yes. The community. Thank you. No, that's th those are really wonderful points. And you're right. I, I hope I'm clear. You know, a lot of the this journey um, has been going to a deeper place for me than I think I had been going in a professional level. You know, and uh, people say to me all the time at work, "Oh, you you know, this must be such a hard job." I mean, these are like grieving families, and they'll say, "Oh, you you know, you know, I'm so." I'm like, wait, but. It's so different now. I say you have the hard job right now, you know, because um, you know I, I've had some training and tools to do this. As I've had to go through my own journey, it, it's a very different road and path. And so um, it, it will be an ongoing one. And uh, it's always again sometimes two steps forward, a couple steps back, and that that's how this works. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time and for for uh, your attention this morning. Happy to fix my slides, get rid of some of the uh, typos. I'll share them, and you can use them however. So, yeah. Thank you so much, David. Great presentation. I forgot something in, in the beginning, and that was to ask David to lead us in prayer. So maybe you will close us down, David, with a prayer. Well, that David, no, oh. please. <laughs> let, let the prayer... I, you know, well, okay, sure, all right, thank you. Sure, all right, thank you, David. Yes, I was like, let us pray. Holy God, in you we, um, we have our refuge and our strength. You are our source of, of being. Um, we come to you in, in gratitude for this time together, uh, for the ability to connect uh, both with head and with heart, and also socially distanced through our bodies um, as we are created to do. I pray for this community as, um, as everyone in this room and beyond begins to encounter this season, these seasons of, of holidays. We ask that you would, um, you would work through your spirit to help us be mindful that these holidays are truly holy days created by you to help us remember who you are and who um, we are to you. Uh, beloved children of you, pray that even as we experience our own feelings of sadness, feelings of loss, feelings of loneliness and disconnection, that you would work through all those moments um, to show us your way to give us your peace, the peace that passes all of our concepts, all of our theories, uh, all of our ability to understand. May that peace be in our minds, be in our hearts, and uh, flow through our bodies as we connect with one another. We pray this in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. I hope that uh, you found that this was useful today that you get some good ideas for helping with the holiday. Next month, we will have a more uh, cheery <laughs> topic. We will be discussing uh, Christmas carols Ooh. and singing some of them. Nice. So I hope you will be able to join us then. Uh, I believe it's December 8th, whatever. It's the second Wednesday in December. So if you would all like to join us for some coffee and conversation. Those of us here in the room, we will be going out to the courtyard because we can't eat inside. And for those of you online, uh, if you'll click the link for the Zoom, we will have a couple people there to chat with you also. Thank you, and David. If I may just take a moment of pastoral um, privilege. So on the subject of grief and also holiday season, those of you know this, we have a annual service of remembrance, and that's when we gather together. That, that will be on 
Tuesday, December 7th at 6 p.m. in the Westminster Hall, where if you have experienced in this past year, within the past years, we'll welcome you to come and we can worship together in the holy season. So thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Sue.